is an artist. Okay. Maya Rudley is an artist and educator born in Busan, South Korea. Lee's recent exhibition, um, which actually was just recently taken down at the MCA Denver through August 2021. Uh, Lee's other solo exhibitions took place in 2016 and 2018 at Eli Ping Francis, New York and Jack Hanley Gallery, New York, respectively. Lee participated in numerous group exhibitions, including the Whitney Biennial 2019, Canada Gallery, Studio Museum 127, Salon 94 in New York, Roberts and Tilton Gallery in LA. Lee was director of Wide Rainbow, a nonprofit after school art program from 2016 to 2020. And Lee's work is held in the public collections at the Whitney Museum of American Art. She lives and works in Salida, California, Salida, Colorado. Um, okay, Maya, thank you so much for being with us. And also um, for this lecture, I think we would all prefer if people can open their cameras. So if anyone, if everyone can do that, that would be really great. All right, it's nice to see people. I kind of asked if, if you know, I suggested to, to have everyone open their cameras just so that I'm not like talking into the abyss. Um, I'm so excited to be here. I didn't realize that this was the first artist talk of the year for you guys. So, you know, this is kind of, this is a great honor for me. Um, sh should I just start? Yeah, okay. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to say I'm very grateful to be here. Um, thank you thank you for inviting me um, to do this talk. My name is Mai Ruth Lee. I'm an artist currently based in a small town called Salida in Colorado. I am Korean American um, and grew up most of my life in Nepal and Seoul um, and relocated to the US 10 years ago. Um, I have a multidisciplinary practice. I like to experiment with different mediums, most oftentimes working with unconventional materials. Um, I guess I wanted to start this talk um, by showing you some of my older works and progress towards some more recent works of mine. Um, so yeah, let's start with the first slide. Um, so shortly after arriving in the US, I had mentioned I arrived here about 10, 10 years ago. Um, I was quite perplexed by the changes in my environment. I'm sure that there's many of you in this program currently that um, are not US citizens maybe um, and are other countries, other parts of the world. So maybe you can sort of understand um, what that feeling must be like. So I was thrown into really rediscovering um, what my newfound language would be here. Um, I grew up speaking uh, three languages, Korean, English, and Nepali. Um, but even though I am fluent in English, arriving in the US, I was still very perplexed. And I still had the, this urge and this need to find my language. Um, I started experimenting with materials I could find easily and also out of practicality because I was totally broke at the time. Um, I sourced what was accessible to me. And one of the first pieces I made upon arriving in the US was this, what I call heat painting. Um, this installation is a marriage of two materials um, and an electrical heat blanket, which is the uh, brown layer in the back and with the overlay gray fabric, which is a heat sensitive fabric that changes color um, with heat. So the snaky pattern that shows up is in fact the electrical wire um, that emits, emits heat in, within the blanket that you normally cannot see. So um, I can talk a little bit more about this piece later because it comes up again, but I just kind of wanted to start off with this piece. Um, next slide, please. Um, so another accessible material I found around this time were steel scraps. 
I started obsessing over visiting all the hole in the wall metal shops near my studio in Brooklyn in Guanis at the time. Um, I relocated here last year. So I was in the States. I, when I first arrived in the States, I was in New York. Um, so, and I started collecting the discarded pieces of steel that are left over from structures like windows and fences. And I was soon drawn in intuitive shapes and movements within these pieces and started to weld one to four pieces together to create um, a new body, like a, lex a body of lexicon, which I titled Steel Glyphs. Um, these signs and symbols are created in a very quick manner. So, you know, when you're working with uh, welding and, you know, I had to work with metalsmiths at the time because my studio, it was a hazard to, to do welding. So they are building real structures. So when I, you know, kind of go into their space and dump all these scraps in front of them, they really don't give me that much time. So. Um, within about uh, 10 to 15 minutes, I have to kind of zap everything into place. Um, so the process is actually quite intuitive, very quick, um, without much process, there's no sketching. And when they're brought back to the studio, I will likely, you know, sit and study them. That's when I assign them new meaning. Um, this piece was exhibited at Salon 94. Um, in 2016. Next slide, please. An example for a couple of these steel glyphs. The left side, um, the left, the glyph on the left, I titled death. The right side um, is called, is titled life, for example. Next slide. Um, around the same time, I also started painting again. I studied painting in um, Korea at a, a university called Honik University. And um, the painting, I guess, curriculum or uh, education in Korea at the time, I think it's changed a lot, was very, uh, I guess, conventional. Um, we had to stick to oil outline of our entire four-year curriculum. And so I quickly got very annoyed and uh, frustrated with, with that. And so I had sort of not gone back to painting for about almost 15 years. So this was the first painting I, I made um, after about 15 years. And this is a, a series of paintings. This is just one of the pieces um, out of 10. Um, but this is from a series titled Thematic Borders. So at this time, as I was saying, you know, I'm, res I'm, I'm trying to be resourceful as possible. Um, so one of my uh, inspirations at the time was sort of investigating already existing materials. So the thematic borders comes from an already existing clip art book from the 90s. And what I found interesting was each um, thematic border, this one, was I think titled maybe Inia or something like that, but there were borders that, um, you know, expressed parties, so ribbons. Um, there's more geometric shapes that sort of uh, kind of express more of an art deco style. Um, but I was really drawn to that primarily because I found that the thing that attracted me most was that the author had sort of chosen to lay these motifs out this way. I didn't change the motifs or the composition at all. I only kind of took the clip art directly and kind of enlarged them about 40 times in, in size and painted them with India ink directly onto raw canvas. So I really liked um, the series also because it reminded me sort of like a, I guess, a physical space, a garden or blueprint. And the economy of space was something I was drawn to as well, like how the author decided to place these motifs the way they did in a symmetrical manner to avoid any wasted space. Um, next slide, please. Um, my parents still live in Nepal, so I visit them 
or not right now, obviously, but I used to visit them about once or once every two years about. Um, I started noticing um, about 10 years ago when I started visiting them from the US, um, the luggage that came down the conveyor belt. Um, I had seen this type of luggage growing up, but I never took notice until sort of recently in my life. And I just was really drawn to these objects. I was just compelled to know a little bit more about where they were coming from, where they were going, um, how and why they were wrapped this way. And it almost seemed like everyone had this secret code of knowing how to wrap it in this almost exact same manner. So over the course of about, of about five to eight years, I started documenting luggage coming down the conveyor belt and collected over about 500 images of luggage. And during my research, I also found out one of the reasons why the luggage was bound and sort of protected this way is because a lot of the migrant workers from Nepal who are coming back from the Middle East or Malaysia um, are protecting their goods because um, the international airport in Kathmandu is also infamous for taking things out of the luggage. So this evoked sort of a bigger picture of like many ideas for me, such as, you know, self-preservation, protection, privacy, travel, family, migration, um, diaspora communities. And it really kind of also evoked the idea of the body as well. Um, each of these luggage pieces had such character and all the materials again are household materials, easily accessible materials that one could find in their homes. And there was something very endearing about them as well. So I started sort of thinking about what I wanted to do with this and next slide, please. Um, I started creating my own. Um, a lot of the materials here are actually um, uh, sourced from Kathmandu um, uh, during my visits. And I started making these prototypes. I call them the bondage baggage prototypes. And I wanted to sort of experiment um, upon sort of like, you know, uh, my research as well and seeing how all of these materials act with each other. Um, how this type of bondage or how this type of uh, wrapping um, could evoke certain types of types of emotions, um, how certain installations um, using bondage baggage could, could evoke some type of um, equilibrium of different emotions as well. Um, next slide, please. And I just kept going with it it was sort of, I started obsessing over it again and really kind of thinking about uh, what the materials can be, uh, what the materials inside are, um, what, uh, what stories or narratives do I want to portray? Um, so yeah, it kind of just started from there. Um, next slide, please. Um, this was, uh, all piece that I, I did for the 2019. Um, and I revisited the steel glyphs, um, except for this time, kind of, I wanted it to have like this um, sort of a grand gesture. Um, this piece is titled Labyrinth. And I felt that the wall was placed directly in front of a window that was facing eastward into Manhattan. And I wanted to create a site-specific piece because I wanted to sort of have this piece reflect what the city was. Um, these pieces, the steel parts, were collected from all parts of Manhattan and Brooklyn. And I wanted it to sort of mirror um, the city that it was sort of looking out into. And I felt that um, this loose term labyrinth was that I really kind of connect with also because it's one of the most ancient, um, I guess, symbols uh, that exist. 
And unlike a maze, uh, there is only one way in and one way out. A maze is, you know, you can get lost. There are multiple ways to get in. It's almost like a puzzle, but a labyrinth, uh, the way that it is designed is not so much about getting from A to B, it's mostly about the process. And I felt that that emotion was very much about like how I had felt um, sort of leading up to this year or to that year in 2019. Um, next slide, please. Um, I like to create these steel glyph charts along with each installation of steel glyphs, um, mostly just for my own sake, because it's really fun to create. Um, but the layout is quite simple. I try and again, like I mentioned before, I, I try to assign meaning back into the signs and symbols that I create in the metal shop once they're in the studio. And, you know, once I'm studying them for the first time, perhaps, um, I'm able to sort of discover some of these, uh, I guess, intuitive meanings that I feel that they hold. And so it's a little bit kind of a tongue in cheek as well, because I, I like to play a little bit with the idea of horoscopes as well as um, like spirituality as well. And the layout itself graphically, I purposefully would lay it out this way. I wanted it to sort of look like a handout in the street. I didn't want it to look like a design material. Um, next slide, please. Um, this bondage baggage prototype four was also exhibited at the Whitney Museum. Um, I felt like maybe this one had maybe one of the best characters of them all kind of, he, he's become my buddy. I, I kind of, I'm so familiar with this sort of the stack now because I've seen it so much um, just in my own, own mind. But uh, yeah, I like to think of them as, as, as friends. Um, next slide, please. Um, so these are some of my most recent works. This, uh, the show was at the MCA Denver and the title of the show was The Language of Grief. Um, a little bit of background before I explain this work because um, I think it's important just as, as, as context. Um, last year when the pandemic hit New York, we were already out west um, visiting friends. And so when the shutdown happened, we quickly found out that we couldn't return. We, no one was getting on planes, no one was getting on the road um, in fear of just everything and no one really knew what was going on. So we had to make a quick decision of whether to wrap up our lives in New York or not. So after ha having lived there uh, or having my whole US life based in New York, it was kind of a, a dramatic ending because there was no real ending to it, except that we had to call movers and um, call the movers and they packed up our studios and our apartment um, over FaceTime. So that happened and we ended up relocating to here quite randomly. And so, um, you know, it was, such a difficult time for everyone. And on top of that, I was just very devastated to lose my community and my friends and sort of all I knew of America was gone. So having to sort of start over from scratch um, felt quite daunting. Um, so this new body of work was kind of a, a refresh. It felt like a restart button and it was, uh, I was so grateful to be given the chance to sort of dive in because I think if I wasn't able to, I would have just been quite depressed. Um, so as a visual artist, um, you know, I, I wanted to take the challenge of expressing the language of grief in its abstract way. 
Um, and inspired by acemic writing, I wanted to give up notions of language identity, writing terms, or semantics. Um, for some of you who don't know what acemic writing is, just a little bit of, about that. Um, so acemic writing is uh, a global style of writing that is without context. So an open semantic form of writing that is more like, I guess, um, like a shadow or an impression of conventional writing. So, and I say that it's global because the creators of acemic writing are from all over the world. It's international in its mission and it ignores obstacles of education and background. So we have all in some ways participated in acemic writing. So for example, as a child, um, before we learn how to write, before we learn how to read, um, our attempted name writing or scribble um, could be seen as acemic writing. And, uh, and because it is illegible, um, all illegible writing with text is writing. And I learned about this, I guess, I wanna call it a movement because um, I, it's, it's like happening all over the world. And if you Google acemic writing, you're just like, wow, there's a whole community online, especially that follows this movement. And it was coined by two poets back in the eighties. And I just found it so fascinating because my work, I feel like has always been about language. Um, my parents are also linguists. So in my household, language was this esteemed thing. It was the most important thing. Um, to be bilingual was very important in our household. Speaking Korean was very important in our household. Um, so, you know, I think it really kind of wrapped up everything that I had been doing so far, especially in the US, um, the new works that I'd made in the past 10 years. I felt was some ways, all in some ways, acemic writing. Um, and so back to sort of this piece, um, so yeah, when it comes to emotional language, such as the language of grief, uh, it is abstract um, and we are experiencing it collectively. So in some ways, as abstract as it is, there is some type of understanding within it. Um, you know, I think grief is possibly one of the most difficult emotions we experience and 2021 and obviously 2020, 2020 and the near future, it can be summed up in the single experience on various levels. And um, I'm not by any means trying to define what the language of grief is and nor am I trying to do this in the show. Um, there's no articulation here, but rather I think by lexicon, I wanted to show some type of resistance against westernization of language, meaning the linguistic and communicative standards that are restricted by the function of what is legible and what's illegible. Um, that also goes back to education as well. Who has access to education? Who has access to uh, read? Um, so this piece is titled Dictation, and it's a long strip of raw canvas with fabric bandages that is adhered, adhered onto the um, canvas. It's also ironed on, so it's sort of fixed on like patches. Um, and I wanted this uh, piece to sort of look like a scroll. Um, I want the viewer to take a moment to see, you know, whether to to view the works or whether to read the works. And I think there is that sort of gray in between place. Um, and next slide, please. Um, I also created um, a series of paintings, also India ink on raw canvas. Um, and these shapes, these abstract shapes are in fact sewing patterns. And so I wanted to kind of put together this body of work that also obviously um, resembles some type of ancient scriptures or writing or glyphs, but also I wanted it to um, reflect the human body as well. Um, because we're talking about the language of grief and because I was sort of reflecting on the language of grief, I wanted 
um, there to be this uh, twofold experience where um, the script is there in front of you with these abstract shapes, but these are also shapes that we carry around our bodies all the time. So the sewing pads, for example, almost foreign, look at them separately and fragmented. But, you know, if we deconstruct just what we're wearing right now, the inseams of our pockets, our collars, um, our pants or parts of our skirt or shirt or vest, whatever it is, this is what you get. And I felt that the language of grief or the experience of grief is something like that as well. Um, and it's something that we experience physically and we experience on a daily level and we carry with us, it's such a, it's such a personal experience, but how do you express it? Most people cannot um, articulate. So I wanted it to sort of portray the feeling that the body is somewhat a part of it. Same with the bandages on the scroll. Um, you know, the bandages are covering uh, creases of your body, little uh, wounds that are on your knee or your toe or your, or your fingers. The shapes of the bandages I found that was really interesting are designed specifically for different parts of your body as well. So I really wanted to enhance like every part of the human body. Um, next slide, please. These are some details of the paintings. Next slide, please. Um, so I was really happy to revisit the heat blankets or the heat paintings again. When I first made them 10 years ago, I didn't really know what it meant or what it was. I just, you know, took a photo of it in my studio and that's what I showed you earlier. And then 10 years later, I was able to sort of revisit it and bring it back into context. And I was very thrilled about that because in this context, it just made sense to me. And I think, you know, sometimes, you know, when you have practice, you have all of these like different artworks, um, different kind of strains of thoughts, different experiments, all of it is important is all I wanna say. I think um, even though it doesn't make sense at this point, it somehow comes back into the context of your work. And I was really happy because I was able to salvage that um, experience back into something that really kind of made sense and linked up with all of these other works. Um, so these two blankets, um, this installation is called Narration. And it reminded me of almost like a freestyle writing on the wall of, of, of a paragraph. And I wanted it there, they, they turn on and off as well. So you can sort of see the parts that are sort of turning off and turning on. Um, and the electrical heat blanket, um, I grew up with one and it was a huge part of my childhood um, in Nepal. And it is also protection. It's also about uh, protecting your body. And it's also about family as well. And I think the idea of bringing forth something that is invisible. So, you know, bringing forth something that is completely illegible was also sort of my intention in the show as well for the language of grief. So I, I was just happy that all of it kind of made sense together. On the left side of the wall, you can't really see obviously, but it's um, letters that I wrote to friends during the pandemic, um, especially in 2020. And I wanted there to be illegible works and legible works. And I wanted them to sort of be in the same space together because I think the language of grief is both. There are parts that is completely illegible and there are attempts at trying to be legible. And so these recollections of these letters I photocopied before actually I even reached out to people and said, can you photocopy and send it to me? I wanna exhibit it, um, was sort of just my personal sort of strife at that time or in that point. In, in that moment in time, um, kind of recollecting sort of these deeper emotions um, that are normally usually not expressed on a day-to-day -day level. Um, next slide, please. I, I think there's a next slide. Okay, so 
there is a, a video that I created um, called The Stranger in 2018. And Noah, I'm not sure, do we have time to watch this video? I have it on my computer right now. And we can, it's a 20 minute video, but 24 minute video, but I was just gonna play about the first seven minutes or something. Sure, yeah, we can do that. Yeah, okay. Um, so, hold on. So I'll stop sharing, right? Yeah, and I guess I have to share my screen. Okay. Here I go. Can everyone see? Okay, so um, quickly before the uh, before I start the video, um, so I without saying too much about it, um, the footage that you see here is uh, footage that my my father took back in the late '80s upon arriving in Nepal, and um, his narration you will hear. And uh, all right, that's all I'll say about it. Um, for, for anyone who is Korean in here will sort of immediately understand sort of what is happening, but we can talk about that later. Sorry, hold on. Sorry. Ah, cool. Sorry about that. I'm <laughs> Okay, <laughs> I'm 
밥을 먹기 위해서 밥 준비를 하고 있습니다. 오늘은 대부분 아침을 늦게 먹습니다. 그리고 저녁 한 끼, 그래서 하루에 보통 두 끼로 먹는 기억입니다. 所以，我们今天晚上吃什么？今天晚上吃什么？今天晚上吃什么？今天晚上吃什么？今天晚上吃什么？今天晚上吃什么？今天晚上吃什么？今天晚上吃什么？今天晚上吃什么？今天晚上
just pure research for a piece. So like how much of percentage of that time just goes into looking, like doing research in general? I would say approximately about 85% goes into research. Um, the, the making of the piece I am interested in, but I'm not as interested in as much as the actual process of uh, kind of documenting research and studying, reading and writing. Um, yeah, if that answers your question. Um, a lot of the works that I make are very quick, um, sort of out of practicality too. I have a three-year-old, so you know I have limited amount of time in my studio. Um, I mean, it is kind of an excuse, but I think um, it comes to creating creating sculptures or, or paintings. I like to sort of get it done, and I think because it's sort of backed with a lot of the thought process um, that sometimes spans over years, um, the actual making of the piece is quite easy for me. Um, Kiwa wants to know in the chat where someone could view the entire video that you played. Um, I can put the link here if you promise not to share. <laughs> um, it's just, yeah, it's one of those things where, um, I guess, you know, but I, yeah, I would love, I'd love, I would love for you guys to watch it because it's, it is a long video and um, it almost, it does require sort of you to sit down and read the subtitles to kind of follow it. So um, I will happily just link here. It's just a personal Google doc link. So I trust you guys. There you go. Oh, wait. I have a rather, uh, I guess, simple question. Um, but I'm just curious to see, like, um, as an artist, what kind of motivates you or drives you to create the work that you do? Um, your work is very versatile and you, um, you really touch up on a, a whole bunch of things. So I was just curious to see like, if you have like a common motive for the work that you do. Um, I think the main inspiration for me is, uh, hmm. I guess. Uh, Didn't mean to put you on the spot. I was just yeah, no, no, I mean, I am on the spot, so, you know. <laughs> um, I think, um, identity you know identity uh is what motivates me and kind of what pushes me a little bit um sort of being lost in the identity especially uh, from moving around so much from moving from southeast asia to east asia and then as an as an adult coming to the states um in my late 20s um uh, there's a lot of confusion there and i think the confusion around, around identity is something that a lot of people can relate to. Um, and so I think a lot of it is sort of, uh, I guess a necessity in some ways to kind of um, unravel and kind of break down sort of what identity means to me. And I think a lot of, from that comes um, how uh, language works within that um, and how communication works within that. Um, and so I think a lot of the motifs or the materials or the inspirations that I that I get, I end up sort of creating into creating them into sort of this loose lexicon of this sort of cryptic and um, illegible writing, because I think that's kind of like the space that I live in um, in my mind. Um, it's neither this nor that. And I don't want that to uh, I don't want sort of to be represented by this wishy-washy kind of in-between thing, but actually to own it and kind of say this abstract space is mine and this illegible space is mine and, um, and that's okay. I don't need to um, articulate every single thing that I create. And um, I think by adopting this inspiration from ascenic writing, um, it really kind of uh, brought everything together for me.
Okay, um, thank you. We have another question in the chat from Lauren and she said, thank you, Maya, you explained Islamic writing and its influence on your work. Are there any visual poets you admire or collaborate with? Um, I've recently collaborated with um, a Denver-based poet named Carolina Abade, Abade um, and we led a workshop together actually called uh, Writing Through Grief. And so we uh, experimented with a scenic writing in poetry and it was totally fascinating because um, everyone who participated were writers and poets themselves. And it was a two-part workshop. We were able to kind of lay out what acemic writing was and sort of lay out the groundwork for the poets. And then the next week, everyone brought back their own acemic writing poetry. Um, uh, I think it's really inspiring when, when, when we can use uh, lang our, our alphabet or our language as a tool, um, like, a, like an art material. And um, there very, there's a lot of visual artists um, that, that use asynchronic writing. One of my favorite is Chow Fei. Um, I think she's actually based in Brooklyn and she's an incredible, or they're an incredible artist um, using uh, natural found objects. I, I, I kind of want to find this really quick. I just want to just drop it in. just to see, give you an example of their work um, because it is just absolutely stunning and kind of really kind of resembles what, what asymmetric writing is. Um, oh, why can I not find it? Uh, sorry about that. Um, Okay, I'll just drop in um, this image actually. Sorry. Uh, okay, here we go. Okay, it's not downloading, but okay, here, I'll just. This is the um, writer of, of a book titled A Scenic, The Art of Writing. And, oh, A Scenic. If anyone is interested in A Scenic Writing, this is probably one of the best books out there. And I'm explaining, and Chow Fei, for example, she's one, um, a contemporary artist who uses thorns or branches or, um, uh, found uh, natural elements to kind of create this body of, uh, I, I guess, a new lexicon. Um, I have no idea why I can't, I, I'm probably spelling their name wrong. It's not coming up on my Google, but um, you can, yeah, you can look in, into this book and all the examples are right there. Um, and the thorns are kind of utilized as almost like as braille. So you, it almost looks like they're braille, but when you look at them closely, they're actually, you know, rose thorns. And there's uh, this, this type of feeling that you have when you, when you see their work because it's an immediate recognition to something that you know. So that being some type of a, a, a layout or composition of, of Braille or a writing system, but that isn't really something that already exists. That's almost like the trick that asynchronic writing has. It's almost like it draws you right in because it is because it's an impression or shadow of a writing system, you almost feel like you know what it is. And then when you look at it upon looking, you cannot read it. So um, it's a, I, I really love that abstract sort of illegible part of, of asymmetric writing as, as a form of art. Um, Cy Twombly is a good example. Um, he made this series of paintings called resignation letters and they're just like these large canvases with like these large scribbles and they're titled letters of resignation and 
um, I find that very just emotional. It really captures sort of like this, um, this emotion of, of resigning. And it, uh, there are so many artists, um, I guess, um, like that. Um, I mean, maybe there, maybe next time we could do any sort of writing workshop because we can really deep dive into into like lots of different artists who use that as their form of expression. I have a question that piggybacks off of that actually, which is sure. nice uh, for me and Lauren to stack so well. But um, so, like for example, I've been looking at a lot of. Uh, pictographic or glyphic languages for languages that are dead. And, um, you know, because those cultures were wiped out, not because they evolved into something else. And I wonder how much you think about the racemic writing and uh, the kind of glyphic qualities of the, of the wrought iron works as related to uh, unintelligible languages, not just because of intuitiveness, but history and uh, archaeology. Sorry, you, you cut out at the very end. I didn't hear the, your question. Oh, I just said like not just um, in this kind of like uh, unintelligible or internationalist kind of um, like modern international efforts at, at unintelligible writing, but in terms of history or archaeology or um, conquest, things like that. Um, and, and sorry, your, and your question was, or, or, or was that more of a comment? No, just like how much you think about those things. Oh, I see. I see. Like, right, 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 yeah, right. are those connections also part of the work? Are you not yeah. okay with that? Yeah, I mean, I, to some extent, definitely I'm sort of, um, I'm, I'm thinking about those things for sure. Um, but I think I don't also want to fall into sort of like a, a um, full of sort of the history or sort of um, this context of kind of colonized languages mm -hmm. um, because I feel like I want to sort of shift this into sort of more of a forward thinking um, what our language or what a like for example a semic language or a semic writing um, being sort of like the future, I, I want to think about sort of what that means. Um, how uh, globally and universally um, and collectively some of these things can come together sort of. Um, and, you know, it's really interesting when you even, you know, Google Asymic writing and see sort of all these different forms that exist on all different levels and all different countries. And um, how people are experimenting with asymic writing is actually really fascinating because this is of now, this is of, of, of these times. Um, and people are kind of, uh, I guess, reinvigorated by the fact that um, the illegible or I guess the, the illegible part of, of language is in and of itself something to kind of explore. Thank you. Hi, thank you. I have a, also a question. Sure. Um, you mentioned um, pregnancy and postpartum and that you have a three-year-old and I wonder, I mean, three is an age where language is really important. And I wonder how that um, affects your work, if at all. And in general, like how having a child other than, of course, like time affects your work? Um, <laughs> it totally changes everything. Um, it's, uh, I think it's something that I've really tried maybe extremely hard to grapple with. And I'm sure there are some parents here too, maybe, I'm not sure, but um, I think, you know, it just totally, it's mind boggling. It just totally just, changes your whole world and I think uh, as an artist who you know I've worked so hard to sort of carve out my own space to kind of create and work on this uh identity exploration 
it's like a curveball, you know, it was a huge curveball for me. And I'm not going to lie, it was really difficult. But I think um, it also really kind of pinpointed a lot of, it put me on the spot to really think about a lot of these um, these shifts in language and identity as well, uh, bring my child up now that he's, you know, growing up to be a, like a, a small child, like a boy, um, you kind of not a toddler anymore. Um, it's, it's, it's all part of that self-exploration, I think. And, you know, I think uh, for a long time, I'm very interested in the idea of, of labor of women like women in, in terms of like women identifying people in this in the society because I think there's a lot of hidden labor there's a lot of uh, sort of illegible labor that happens that you know now that I'm sort of kind of going through the process of it I it's infuriating you know I'm just like why isn't there a space carved out for us that is um sort of given more, I guess, resources and given more sort of um, understanding of, of this idea of, of, you know, kind of having a family and a lot of this labor that uh, we go through it, that is just unintelligible or illegible. Um, so yeah, sorry, that was like, a, I went on a tangent, but labor is something that I, I've also been really wanting to read more about and um, especially in the US, um, uh, the labor of immigrated women, you know, um, um, sort of the, the hidden labor of our society. Um, thank you so much, Maya. I think we have one more question uh, in the chat. And Christine asks if you're comfortable speaking to it, can, I, can she also ask how you've supported your practice financially since coming to the US? So many random jobs. <laughs> so many random jobs, a lot, a lot of side gigs, a lot of hustling, and how that is, um, uh, especially if you're in New York. I think it's just outrageous how how difficult it is um, to sort of like have an overhead that you need to just keep going and also have a studio practice. Um, and somehow we all do it, which is a complete miracle, I think. Um, I actually landed a job before I even had a studio practice when I came to the US. I worked as a creative producer uh, for a, a big company um, and it was my first and last corpo job. And um, it was a great experience because I just knew that that wasn't the path that I wanted to go down. And um, it was very inspiring for me to just stay on track and um, fight for sort of my role as an artist in this, in this world. Um, I think money is the question, you know, like how do you make ends meet? And um, I think, you know, I've been just so grateful and lucky to have met the right people along the right time in my life to sort of fill in those gaps. Um, and uh, yeah, I just see a question here asking about White Rainbow. White Rainbow was a enormous, like a really big part of my life from 2016 to 2020, it was a, a nonprofit art after school art program that I was a part of, I was a director of, and that definitely um, was my main job uh, for, a, for about five, four or five years um, that I would sort of juggle with my art practice. So yeah, just many jobs, <laughs> many, whatever that could, whatever I could get my hands on. And then um, Maya, if you have time for just one more question and then we'll close it out. Uh, Paul asked, I really appreciate the use of a variety of materials and research in your work. I'm wondering if there's a material that you're excited to explore that you haven't gotten to play with yet. Um, I'm very excited to uh, write. Um, I think writing is something that I'm, I'm terrified of. Um, I'm not good at it. 
Um, but I see that as uh, a material for me. And I want to sort of explore that avenue and um, come out of sort of this, not, not retire from visual art making, but sort of really try and really blend in more my practice with uh, a writing practice. So that's something that I've, I've been sort of working on um, this past year. Um, I can't guarantee that it will ever see the day of light or light of day, but it's something that I'm sort of quietly doing on my own. Um, thank you so much, Maya, and thanks everyone for coming. I think we'll close it out here. So just thank you again, Maya. We really appreciate you coming. Well, thanks for everyone to, you know, being here like so late. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for having me. And I'm looking forward to the studio visits tomorrow. I, so I'll see you uh, tomorrow. <laughs> thank you, Maya. Good night.